thanks a lot for the presentation. I really appreciate also the invitation here. And then today I will talk about the specially explicit population models to deal with issues in inv invasive alien species management. And I would love to start with some questions. So if we plan to manage an invasive population, we should firstly answer three main questions, I think. And the first one is, when can we manage this population? When do we want to manage this kind of population? Do we want to manage this population at the beginning of the invasion, when the invaded area is still very small? We are probably in a lag phase. Or do we want to control this population at time two, for example, after five years or 10 years? Or do we want to control this population when the invaded area is already very large? I mean, this kind of choice is making a big difference in terms of management, uh, cost, benefits, and so on. The second question would be, where can we manage this invasive population? Let's say, let's say that we have some invaded patches. Can we control or can we eradicate or can we remove individuals from core patches? This could be, for example, very useful if we want to reduce the density, so the impact of the species, but maybe in this way we cannot control the invasion. Can we control peripheric patches? So at the periphery, we can remove some individuals and we are limiting the spread of the species. Or maybe there are some access restrictions, so we can just start with some specific points in the space. Maybe some areas are accessible, we have an access, I mean we can go there, we can remove individuals, that will be perfectly fine, but we are not removing the species from many other viewpoints, uh, many other points of the space. And then modes are also quite important. I mean, how can we manage this invasive population? Do we want to remove adults? Removing adults could be like a very good solution. These are breeding animals. But if also if we are removing all these adults, we will have thousands, potentially like 10,000 or millions of individuals that are juveniles, they are maturing, they will become adults again. Or maybe we can remove juveniles. Maybe juveniles are easier to remove, but there are still a lot of adults all around that they are breeding. So maybe we have to make a choice. We have to decide if it's a good idea to remove juveniles, to remove adults, or maybe to remove a portion of both of them. So as you can see, it's quite tricky to make a, a choice, to decide what the best strategy is. And it is particularly difficult because we know that invasive species, invasive population are characterized by non-equilibrium spatiotemporal dynamics. So spy, space and time are strictly connected. And as you can see here, we have a stage one where we can have a prevention, so we can avoid uh, an alien population to establish. We have an initial incursion. This is also called lag phase. Probably we can manage, we can also eradicate this population at the beginning, but over time, the space that we have to manage is becoming larger and larger, and it will be always more complicated to manage this kind of population. This is also called like uh, expansion phase. And then there will be a dominance phase. The impact will be extremely huge, and the effort that we have to dedicate to remove these species will be incredible, gigantic. Now today I will talk about especially explicit population models. Now these tools are allowing us to track the movement of this invasive population across the space. So we will have GPS coordinates, we will have an idea about this, where the species can be and can spread over time. And all these especially explicit population models can be classified in three big groups and this class classification is mainly based on a book that has been published uh, one or two years ago by Dave Richardson and Ken Gui. I, I encourage you to, to read the book, it's actually very interesting. And we have three big groups. We have cellular automata and lattice models. We have metapopulation, gravity, and network models. And then we have individual-based models or agent-based models. Now I will talk about them and I will provide examples about how we can build them. So starting from cellular automata and lattice model, the main point here is that the space is subdivided in discrete cells. So I decided to take into consideration this paper. It is interesting from a theoretical viewpoint and it has also some very interesting graphs. Uh, graphs. As you can see, the space is subdivided in a grid. So we have a grid with many different cells and we can have an invasive species here and the species is moving toward the external part and over time we can simulate how the species is spreading. So the species is moving from one cell to another one 
And we can also use different scenarios. So we can say that we are removing some individuals here. This is a, a treatment part. And we, are, we cannot control other parts. And we can see how the population is invading the space over time. So this would be at time three, this would be at time four, and so on. This is very interesting from a theoretical viewpoint, and this is a simplification of a typical grid-based model. Now, the main point here is that the time and space are discrete, and then we have to define rules. These rules are defining the connectivity among, among cells. For example, we can say that a species in one year, or in 10 years' time, can just invade all the neighbor cells. But we can also take into consideration long distance dispersal. For example, a few individuals can disperse across a huge area, and we can compute this, we can model this in, the, in our model. Another interesting thing is that these cells can be weighted. So we can use a spatial distribution model, and we can say, OK, some cells are probably not accessible. The climate is different, the landscape is, dif is different, the species has not established that. So we can remove this kind of grids. We can weigh them, and here, for example, we are saying that this area is totally unsuitable for our species, this area is partially suitable, and this area here is totally suitable. So we'll be probably invading a very short period of time. And this kind of approach is extremely important when we have to manage large-scale invasions. I mean, if we want to compute uh, a model of a species that is invading South Africa or US, this is a very simple technique. I mean, we can separate, we can divide the space in cells, and we can try to compute this. Now, here, I will provide an example about this. This is a model developed by Orombo and Andres. And this is a model to simulate the spread of management of cost of kudzu, Pueraria Montana. So this is a plant that is from uh, East Asia, is colonizing US and many Pacific islands. It's actually quite interesting because they have been introduced by soldiers, American soldiers in South Pacific islands, to hide themselves from the enemies. And it's growing extremely fast. And as you can see, the impact on the native vegetation is, is huge. So these authors decided to use a grid-based model, a cellular automaton model, to understand how the species is spreading across the landscape. As you can see, the entire space is divided in many different cells. I don't know if you can see the grid, but please trust me. And what you can do, for example, is to use remote sensing images. So you will classify the landscape according to some specific spectral signatures. Each pixel will have a specific value. So you will have, I don't know, these could be like plant, like conifers, this could be a broad leaf, then we have trees and so on. So you, we have a broad idea about the structure on the landscape. And in blue, we have invaded patches. So over time, we can compute how this species is spreading. And this will be very useful for managers. So they develop in this kind of paper, in this paper, a software, a software that is very easy to use. As you can see the result, I mean the output, it's very simple, but it's also very functional. It looks like a video game. But I think this is why it can be also very useful for managers. Because as you can see here, we will have invaded patches. And actually, in red, you have uh, adult individuals. In orange, you have saplings. In green, you have seedlings. And in uh, yellow, you have seeds. So according to the life cycle of the species, you can understand over time which uh, cells will be invaded. And this will be extremely useful for managers. And we can test different scenarios. We can try to replicate the species in some specific areas. And you can see how this kind of model is changing over time. Then we have metapopulation, gravity, and network models. Now, in this kind of models, the approach is different. We cannot control the entire area, but we will have just some specific cells that we can define as nodes in the space that are utilized and connected by edges. Looks like a, a network. And this is a paper that has been published very recently about a pathogen in US. So this bug is uh, attacking, is invading conifers, and is causing a lot of damages in US. So what they decided to do was to model the spread of this species using a network model. This was the beginning of the invasion in 1961, and as you can see, the entire space is subdivided, but 
they are just taking into consideration some specific nodes, and there will be a net of invasion. So this is 1961, this is 1964, 66, and 68. These edges are telling us the probability that one specific node will be invaded over time. So this will be very useful for managers because we know that probably this kind of species in five years or ten years' time will manage to reach this area. And if you want to put traps or you, you want to start a management, you can target that specific area. So each node can act as a subpopulation, so we can run the life cycle of the species in each node. So that's why it would be very important to have like a species-specific information of the species. Each edge can be regulated by dispersal and behavioral rules. For example, I mean, some individuals are moving towards some specific target areas because of their behavior. Uh, the management can be simulated at nodes and edges. So we can simulate to remove some specific nodes because we managed to remove all the individuals there. Or we can also remove edges because we are putting lab barriers. So we are changing the connectivity on this kind of model and we can see how the model is reacting to these simulated scenarios. And this kind of approach can be very useful to target freshwater aquatic invaders. I mean, let's think about fish or, for example, frogs. They are just colonizing a specific subset of the area. They can just live in water. They cannot live outside. They can probably move outside, but they need water to breathe. So this kind of metapopulation model or network model will be very useful for this kind of species. Or also urban invaders. Urban invaders are just in invading urban landscapes. So most of the landscape will not be colonized, but urban areas can be colonized. So we can compute this kind of uh, scenario. And this, is, this would be example. That would be my example. It's what I studied for my PhD. And we had a problem in, in Stellenbosch close to, I mean, in Cape Town, because there is an invasive species of toad that is rapidly colonizing a peri-urban area. So all these are ponds, and I located all these ponds using aerial images. I took the GPS coordinates, and there are in very, actually, small area, more than 400 ponds. Now, the species that is from another part of South Africa is invading this area, and this is a peri-urban landscape. So it means we have, like, big properties with amazing gardens, I've never seen anything like that. And so the species is a synanthropic, so it's living very well close to humans, and it's colonizing these uh, areas. We knew that the species was located for the first time in 2000 in this pond here. And after a few years in Cape Town, they decided to eradicate or to try to eradicate the species. So we have also eradication data. And the idea was, OK, with this kind of data, we can build a model, we can validate the model, and we can try to understand how the species is spreading across the landscape. So this was the situation in 2000 when we observed for the first time the species. And the situation in 2006, there is a typical lag phase that this has been observed in the field. In the first few years, they were always finding the species in a very small area. This was the situation in 2011. I used this data to validate the model, to build the model. And this is the result of the model after a few years. So an entire invaded area, a typical exponential phase. So now this kind of model that has been uh, published in ecological modeling recently can be flexible enough to test different eradication scenarios. So what we can do is we can say, well, we have access to some specific ponds, some specific properties. We can remove some individuals in these ponds, and we can check how the population dynamics is changing over time. And the main limitation that we had in Cape Town is that we were targeting some specific ponds and properties, but many of them were not accessible. So for example, owners are not there. Many of them are European, so they are living there in just, very, in just a very small period of time. So when you want to remove the species, the owners are not there, so you cannot get access to the properties. Or some owners were very happy about these toads. So these toads can call. Their, their call is also very noisy. So some people can sleep, but there are some people that love the species. If you cannot get access to some specific properties, maybe you cannot remove the species, you cannot control it. So we wanted to understand if this was like a major limitation. And I don't know if you can see these crosses, but where you have these crosses means that we cannot 
we can get access to the ponds, but where we don't have cross it means we cannot get access because the owners were not willing to do that at that time. So the, we re rerun the model using this kind of scenario. Uh, well, the result was not encouraging, so what we observe is that the number of accessible ponds was too low, so it was not allowing us to control the population. It was not possible to stop the invasion, but it was just possible to reduce the density, the total density of the population. So we did that with the guttural toad, but we also try to compute some more theoretical scenarios with other species. We ask, okay, we know what's going on with these species, with these specific life history traits. We know that one male can lay 20,000 uh, eggs, we know how they disperse, but if we are trying with another species, with the different life history traits, but with the same technique, with the same effort, what can happen? So this is the situation for the guttural toad. It was impossible to control the species considering this kind of limitation. This is another interesting species. This one is invasive in Cape Town too, not specifically in that area. It's a very small um, uh, frog, painted reed frog, with different life history traits. We tested this, and the result was once again like negative. The dispersal of the species is even uh, higher, so can disperse up to 3,000 uh, meters. And once again, this restricted property acts as significantly constrained management success. But then, theoretically speaking, we computed the model with the African clawed frog, so we know the dispersal capabilities of the species are lower, the life cycle is, is different, cannot invade a very uh, big area in a very short period of time. And actually, for example, with this kind of species, we can control the population just getting access to some specific properties. So it means that also the response, the management, has to be species specific. We need to understand a lot about the species before starting or before planning a reliable and effective management. And then we have the last group of models. These are individual based models. These are, from my viewpoint, extremely fascinating models. It is a typical bottom up, bottom -up approach. Uh, that tracks each individual across space. So the properties of the system are emerging from the individuals or from the agents. And this was an attempt uh, conducted by Dr. Pablo Garcia Diaz. He was trying to understand how each individual frog is dispersing across the space. It took a while, a huge computational effort, and this was the result. It is a typical random walk where some individuals are moving randomly. A few of them, just a minority of them, has a weird behavior that is allowing them to reach some very peripheric areas. And these are actually the most dangerous individuals because they, re they can reach like, very far points. But the, po the point in this kind of model is that you are individually tracking each individual. So it takes a lot of time and we need to know a lot about our species. We need to know a lot about the dispersal behavior. We need to know a lot about the survival, the fecundity, the number of eggs. And this is a life cycle of, of the guttural toad that I did for my model. So imagine if you have to track these individuals from eggs to tadpoles to metamorphs, juveniles, adults, they're probably moving across the space in a very different way. You will have like a huge I mean, it will require like a huge computational effort. We need detailed information about life history traits of the target species for this kind of models. It is potentially more realistic, but sometimes we are not looking for extremely realistic models. We are looking for realistic and functional models that are easy to parameterize, to validate, and, and to test in the field. A partial solution is that you can compute this kind of individual based model into a cellular automata model or a meta population model. So what you're doing is to subdivide the space, each individual is moving and is falling down into a specific cell of the grid. So you're combining these two different approaches and this is what they did in my example in, in this paper published by Idei et al. in 2018. So they use a simulation modeling to inform management of the Eastern Brook trout in the US. So they wanted to understand if two different techniques, the electrofishing and chemicals, are effective to control this invader. So this is a freshwater species, as you can see, 
and they had, I think, like a very cool idea, like a brilliant idea. They decided to subdivide the river network into small patches. So these are dots. The entire river network is subdivided in patches, and you can take into consideration these patches. And you can run an individual's made base model on each individual within each patch. They had a lot of information about this target species, and this is what you have to compute in each patch. So it, of course it requires a lot of time, a lot of information. So you have how individual breed, how they behave, how the density is affecting their survival. You're using all these different life history traits, and then you can test different eradication scenarios. Here you can use eradication, like an eradication program where you're using chemicals, or a suppression program where you're using electrofishing. Now I'm not showing the result because I don't have much time, but the main point was that if you're using electrofishing, you can kill a lot of adults, but because of the size, you cannot target juveniles. If you're using chemicals, of course, uh, it's more impacting on the environment, but you are killing at the same time adults, juveniles, you are suppressing the treatment, and this is actually much more effective. So this te they tested these different techniques, and they found a potential solution. So in conclusion, what we can say is that especially explicit models are already an invaluable tool for invasive alien species management. However, the diversity of approaches now available requires to consider a few aspects. The spatial and temporal scales of your uh, target species. Do we want to target a restricted invasion, like a spatial restricted invasion, or an invasion that is covering huge distances? Do we have species-specific information about the target species? I mean, what do we know about the species? Are we making some very simple assumption, or we know a lot, for example, about the gray squirrel or the pala squirrel and so on? We need to consider computational time. Individual based models are very promising, but they require a lot of time, a lot of effort. And we need field data to parameterize and validate the model. That's why what I'm suggesting is, if you're eradicating the species, please try to get as much data as possible. We need reliable data. We need to record what's going on. If we, you can keep this data, that will be very useful to build models and to understand more about how we can control the species. And then the last thing that we have to do with this kind of model, we have to test their sensitivity. So we have to change slightly some life history traits or some uh, dispersion traits, and we have to understand how the model is changing the output. Now, if the model is very sensitive, is extremely sensitive, so to some life history traits, and we cannot collect reliable life history traits, probably we have to change the model. We have to change something in our strategy. And I would love to, to thank these people and these institutions, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions because of the time, but uh, the, 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 as you know, we've been discussing the role of uh, uh, the, the importance of access to private land also for the squirrels. So this is uh, something that uh, we know very well the problems of uh, limited access to, to private land for controlling the squirrel also in this area. So the next speaker is Jacopo Cherry. Um, thank you so much and. Uh,